modernizing industry in Calcutta. The linking of modern art to the demands of modern manufacture, consumption, and publicity would find its most effective fruition in the period in these image repertoires of posters and advertisements. The 1940s and 50s emerge as a sharply etched cameo in the long history that I have mapped here of the passage of the vocation of design from the field of craftsmanship to a new thriving sphere of modern practice, from the aesthetics of the ornamental to that of the modern. Sorry, I'll come to the last slide. These were the years when, through the initiative of the art and industry movement, the art of advertising won its hard-won and short-lived space within exhibitions and journals as a creative genre in its own right, a short-lived space. And a new prestige accrued on the work and designation of visualizers, graphic designers, and art directors in newspapers and corporate houses and manufacturing firms, all of which developed active art and publicity departments. If the Journal of Indian Art and Industry elaborately showcased the success of the colonial tutelage of India's crafts and decorative arts, and archived its main repertoires of forms and designs, and I went through a lot of that, Half a century later, its close namesake, the Art and Industry magazine, fulfills the same role in a dramatically transformed national and modern world commercial order. It holds high India, independent India status as a center of modern Indian design and manufacture on par with the Western world. It gives the new nation its own legacy of commercial art, and it provides the history of advertising in India with one of its early and most valuable image archives. Thank you. Breathtaking range of material and just so many connections between histories that we know and histories that we don't know. So thank you very much. And we open it for questions, references, comments from the audience. Madam, you spoke on the contribution of I'll just give you the, I'll give you the okay. Where can one see all of the art and industry magazines? <clears throat> They exist in some private collections. Uh, I have not found them in any library holding. So um, as I said, I've been in the institution which, where I work. It's a social science institution, but we've been building up a text and visual digital archive. So we have as many of the issues digitized, but we also have some of the original issues. Uh, I would have suspected that it would have circulated in all the major you know, and I would have said, given how many of the commercial artists are working both in Bombay and Calcutta, they're working with them, I would have suspected that it should exist. I would have said Bombay Art Society Library could well have had it. I know that it ceased to exist. It's not obviously, say, like journals like Jisua or Rupam, which have had, also are difficult to get hold of, but are much better documented. Journal of Art and Industry, I must say, exists, I'm sure, in a few collections, but it's like a forgotten thing. In fact, Kipling's journal, for all scholars who worked on colonial craft education, has been much more widely written about. This hasn't. So it's one of the projects, but it's really an amazing archive on early design and advertising. And because, as you know, advertising being an ephemeral art, there's very little documentation of it. Studios very seldom keep the material. The other thing, most of the work that I showed here, for instance, of Osi Ganguly, were actually from his family collection, as with Priyogopal Das. So, you know, in the odd case, the families maintain albums. While we know that advertising firms, and I've been looking into this possibility, they throw away their archives. Uh, I mean, in Calcutta, where DJ Kema was, this place on Mirza Ghalib Street has been a continuous home for advertising for 50 to 60 years now, but they have no archive. Uh, and I know because from DJ Kema to Clarion, they moved through things. Partly now that advertising has all gone digital, I think there's been very little investment in the firms themselves. But I know scholars of advertising, and we're trying to put together, pull together a forum where we can bring it. There's an interesting digital website, which uh, my daughter who's here worked in advertising, and they put up this website 
uh, which was called Ekhane Bigapon Mariben. You know, the classic thing was, don't put advertisements here, the walls would say. So this digital thing actually said, paste all your old advertisements. They put together a very interesting digital archive on old advertising. I know that some of the firms have maintained it, but following the careers of commercial artists have been a lot. Because, you know, they also want that recognition. You know, they felt they were really creative figures, but no work has really been done on their careers and oeuvre. And to, you know, bring that out, I found that many of them are wanting to become so-called pure artists, and they prefer to display their paintings and sculptures, but actually, the return to commercial, you know, to go through that genre was unusual. So I'm hoping with some of our joint efforts, this will become a new field of work. <laughs> reminded of the Bombay Art Society journals, yeah. but I was also reminded of the cement company journals, which some yeah. of the artists were there, but they, they existed quite a popular range and they circulated like designs in the 40s, designs yeah. in the 50s. This is a, also, ICI and the cement companies are doing a lot of advertising. So ICI is another very major advertiser. Well, I wanted to say, you know, one archive that has come up in Bombay itself is the Godridge archives. You know, they've put together a lot of very, very interesting material, of course, only on Godridge products. But, you know, through that, one gets a lens into precisely this period and a figure like Pirocha. And, you know, manufacturer, of course, on a far different scale than the small-time Bengali manufacturers who were doing primarily toiletries and products, not really going in for steel and big things. So I think the story of manufacture, consumption, and advertising go together. And I think there's still a lot of material to be drawn out and very important, both social, cultural. But I think to turn the attention of art history to it is also very, very important, I think, because it's this moment, as I say, when suddenly it becomes an artistic profession in its own right. Mm. So because I think we have a sense of that late 19th century, early 20th century, and then we know what is happening in the 70s, 80s, 90s, mm. but I think what happens in your uh, lecture and presentation is, at least for me, it <coughs> opened a certain kind of a bridge mm between some of the sort of early 20th century preoccupations and how we look through the lens of art history, the questions of art, commercial art, the design schools or architecture schools that exist, and how probably that transits, and obviously one will have to evaluate the role of an NID also somewhere in the middle there, but it does sort of give a sense of what could be a bridge subject to the question of design and commercial art into the more sort of the later 20th century actually. You know, I think certainly there's a designated department called commercial art in the School of Art in Calcutta, set up in the 20s. And there's a full archive of posters. And they had a separate section in commercial art in the annual exhibition. My hunch is that JJ would have had the same. And JJ also has the only architecture school opening, which would have had a whole different premise on it. I think Kalabhavan is the other unit I'd like to work on. There, of course, it becomes much more craft-oriented, and this becomes much more modern industrial design. But this idea of design really providing that intermediary space where artists and craftspeople talk to each other, I think Sriniketan is the other experimental space where they're really doing art for a craft for modern living. What also interested me, Kaivan, was that when I did go to NID, that one of the biggest projects that NID undertakes is the Handmade in India project, right? So the way in which modern design continuously turns to traditional craft as the important resource for thinking about more. I think that is something I'd like to push more to see where, why. It's a continuous trajectory where you need to return. I think that JJ Architecture archives have really opened up in the last few years mm -hmm. because Mustan Sir Dalvi has been working <coughs> on it. So from few papers published in journals to a full book that we did as part of the State of Architecture exhibition. So that's mm -hmm. published. But I guess the commercial, which even their uh, sculpture studio is, is amazing to just see the sculpture studio in the art section. But their sort of archives of drawings would surely be interesting. I would have said Times of India would be the other huge resource because it seems to have employed so many of these early artists. And of course, stores like Army and Navy, these departmental stores which employed them for window dressing, you know, show cards. So whole spaces 
directly linked with consumption opening up, which I think is important to explore. You highlighted the contribution of Kolkata in arts. What is the contribution of Mumbai in turn for this art and architecture? <coughs> Contribution of I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a parallel story to be written. Um, as I said, one could only focus on a small archive and write about it. But I don't think that the story I'm saying is at all unique to Calcutta. I wouldn't make that claim. I would say that similar skills and particularly to think about a language of modernism and to think about something specifically modern in commercial, industrial, and graphic design, which is also negotiating the vocabulary of, say, Indian style with Western modernism, would be happening across. And to look at this passage from the art of book and cover design, illustration, into the product field. I think it must be happening in several centers. I think Calcutta and Bombay are particularly interesting parallels because they're the centers of advertising, too. Certainly more than Bombay. 40s and 50s, and that's why art and industry has all the powerful industries and manufacturing firms and the press and the government departments coming together behind this. So it's a good reflection on how you support manufacture and art together and bring it together. I would say the parallel history in Bombay of the same period is extremely important to write about. I've not looked at the material, is all I will say. I'm sure it's waiting to be written. It's also a question of archives opening up. So as, as, as you mentioned, the Godrej has sort of now practically institutionalized its archive and access to the archive or programming, etc. For example, the ACC, where some of the, uh, the cement company from where some of the journals came, their archives, I know that earlier they were more accessible and after a after the point they just became like a sealed door or very difficult to get into. I think what I've heard, I've never worked, but the Times of India archives have become equally sort of uh, difficult to get into and get access to. It's As has the Statesman archives, yeah. Uh -huh. You see, the other interesting pro uh, project here is, of course, to see when photography and uh, comes in because a lot of the advertising I've shown is hand-drawn and print-based and which keeps the photograph away. And I think through the 60s and 70s, the idea of the drawn image, oh, she becomes sure. very iconic. It's actually a hand-drawn sketch. You see the importance of the hand-drawn artwork in the advertising studio, I think, continues for much longer than we think. Even today, the art studio is an important one. But I was very interested in this question of the graphic and the hand-drawn, where photography for a long time is not part of the art. So the best advertising work is not coming out of photography. Though I think there's a parallel tradition where film stills, a lot of film work, I think Sabina Gadihoke's work has shown how a lot of actresses come into advertising. And, and they, therefore, the film industry and the advertising industry work together. But I've been interested precisely in the graphic design, which is non-photographic and the ways in which that fuels that art. And I think that for the coming of photography, and certainly digital era is a different era, but I think 70s is when photography becomes a very, very big thing in advertising. Before that, there's still a lot of premium on the hand-drawn or the designed ad. You know, um, up to the 50s, uh, in the kinds of advertising, which were largely, you see, for also what's quite interesting that you have exhibitions that were devoted only to. So a lot of, you know that the best designs often don't get taken up, right? So they go into some archive. So what the art and industry exhibitions did, they showcased advertising independent of whether it got selected by the client and they got awarded. Now, all of them were therefore non-photographic. So right through the 50s, when I'm looking through the pages, photography features in terms of bringing crafts, piece, and exhibition spaces, but does not directly enter the advertisement. I think it begins to happen much more directly, I think, from the 70s. I'm thinking of one very major ad which used photography. is the made-for-each-other ad that wills begins, it's all over India, it's a huge campaign. It's, I think it's late 60s, so I think, again, important to think when 
photography will come in in a big way. So a lot of the animal hoardings and all I've looked at, that's why I think the 20s to 50s is a very, very interesting period to look at. Where photography is otherwise very, very being widely used everywhere else, but it's somewhat slower. The one person whose photographic advertisements we have in our archive is Ahmed Ali. He's a very major fashion and industrial photographer. And he is directly using a lot of photographs in advertising. Again, 60s is a lot of that work, late 50s, 60s. So I think one would have to look at different genres even in advertising, you know? Look at and how these are evolving. Uh, thank you for an uh, absolutely, absolutely fascinating uh, lecture. I was just curious, um, you know, was there any, ever any kind of, a, let's say, uh, kind of let's say, political let's say, dimension that you find in the works of maybe some of the artists? I mean, one, of course, was where I think you kind of spoke of uh, one of the artists who begins to return to more traditional forms of representation, breaking away from some of the uh, basically modernist, let's say, grammar you know, that you find emerging. Because in a certain sense, the language of basically modernism was as important as the modernist project itself, you know, as a way to introduce uh, that kind of aesthetic, you know, into, into, a, into a newly <coughs> emerging kind of independent education. So I'm just curious, was there ever, did you find in any of your research uh, a, certain kind of okay, a certain kind of political angle or dimension to any of the artists or a site to resistance of sorts? Um. Um, not really, but partly because very little is really known out of, you know, the, the kinds of larger biographies. Though 40s and 50s, um, some of this begins to feature. But if so far as by the political you're really meaning a certain sense of nationalism and progress and, you know, of a new modernist project of the nation building, which is so important uh, in the 50s, which is reflected in architecture in journals like Marg and Design, the, the magazine that comes out of Architecture Magazine in Delhi. I think it gets reflected, and I think, therefore, as Kaivan was saying, cement, Tata iron and steel, certain products, the, the language, and one of the pictures I showed next to Bata's shoes is a Tata iron and steel, which looks like a Ferdinand Leisure painting. I think a lot of the products particularly industrial products, and therefore you're also talking about modern interior design of transport design, trains, compartments. So I think in some sense there's a larger project of nation industrial development where photographers and the advertising professionals together work. And that's where to me the nationalization of the profession, so where national industry and the profession, and that's why that art room image of the 40s. And the family said it's a rare photograph because they would be wearing suits for when they met the bosses of the firm. But clearly inside the art room, it's a space of a different kind of camaraderie of art students and commercial artists coming together. And that art room photograph is very rare. One finds so little of it allows me to think that perhaps there is a whole professional world where they would move into pavilion design, into film art design. So Osi Ganguly's career post-60s, he, he becomes art director in several small films, none of which make a big name. So art design and films, pavilion design, particularly with the expos, would take the commercial artist in very different direction. And of course, the story in Calcutta is that from the 70s, industry and advertising and manufacture really begins to flee out of the city. So Calcutta's own story, Calcutta ceases very quickly to be that hub, though a lot of creative talent continues. And I think it feeds the advertising industries all around India. But, and also I think the coming of NID, coming of the Delhi College of Art, of the School of Planning, and the whole new centers where one would go to be trained as a designer. One would not necessarily come out of that. So I think the importance of Calcutta or Shantaniketan remains, but they don't quite move into the new categories of high design. I haven't addressed the question of the political because it's an interesting question. One would have to think of it not in terms of any direct way, but ways in which certainly the rhetoric of nation building and industrial development is all there. You know, and why you bring 
artists into bring create a new dialogue between manufacturing industry and artists. And this is if in the 80s and 90s the colonial art administrators have one kind of push. I'm trying to think of that. So to me, these two moments of art and industry in a way became a way of thinking about the paper. Let me put it because to me the the even the changing designations of the term art in industry was what. But it's an important thing to think about. What what their national prestige would have been if I was to ask, and I think none of them have that really. Very few of them would have it, which the artists do, which the architects begin to demand. I don't think the commercial artist ever carries that prestige. They're often recognized to be very creative and talented people within advertising circuits, where they don't really become national figures of any kind. Though many artists like Hussein, you could say, were also doing a lot of design-oriented work, but they were also artists. So that is what gives them that kind of place. Yeah, my question is actually linked to some of the images you showed of uh, Priyo Gopal Das in 1992. And I was wondering whether they were different influences working <coughs> on uh, art and advertising and design and art in the Bengal school. Because if you see that these are images I've never seen before, but if you look at them, some of them have very, you know, art nouveau-ish imagery. There is futurism in that image of Tata Steel. Yeah, and except for maybe a little bit of cubism and, you know, Gagandaran's work, there was a completely different aesthetic which was developing in art, apparently. So is, were there different influences working in these two areas? I like to think that <coughs> the same influences would be spilling from one to the other. Because many of these people, are the ones who come out of art schools, are in dialogue with artists. So the fact that, and if you look at a tradition of uh, the book illustration and cover design in Bengal, and I can speak for it, it's very, very closely aligned. So figures like Urai, Shukumar Rai, they are also becoming very important supporting forum for Abhinindranath Tagore and his movement. The journals are bringing out color plates. So it's not a world that have their backs against each other, they speak to each other. And the fact that this vocabulary, this loose vocabulary of what we call Indian style painting, gesture, form, motif, certain kind of poises of figures, are directly drawn out of that. So the fact is a lot of the so-called Bengal school artists also do a lot of book illustration and cover design. So that is where there's a direct kind of thing. So they're directly doing book illustration and cover design. And the fact that commercial art in Calcutta, which is a stronghold of academic training, and the fact that you have the Bauhaus exhibition in Calcutta in the 20s, not of 